In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Peter, and uh, we're going to go ahead and, and delve into this. To understand really where I'm coming from here, I think that in so many ways, so many ways, we have lost who we are as a country, and I'm there's a news story that ties into this. I am not a pop culture person. I think that anybody that watches will tell you I'm pretty good at comic books, and I know a decent amount about movies, but as far as like TV shows, I'm a little bit lost on that, honestly. I don't really delve into that. I'm, I'm news and politics for a reason. But this story really jumped out at me. And the reason is because of it's a, a great little microcosm of the way the world thinks and how they view Christians. So there's this girl named Hannah Brown, who is the star of The Bachelorette. Now, I don't, I've never seen an episode of the show. I honestly don't understand how it works. I know that it's some kind of dating game show. I, I don't really understand the format, but uh, I know that I'm just going off of the what I got from an article about this. And according to the article that I read, um, she was talking about one of the guys that she got rid of, one of the guys that she, I guess, voted off the island, to put it in survivor terms, is a guy that she slept with four times. And her response to this, and the reason this is so significant is because she is somebody, because this wouldn't be surprising to anybody on a reality show, would it? I mean, you hook up with somebody, you decide you don't like them and ditch them the next day. That's kind of par for the course if you're talking about a normal reality show. The reason that this got so much media buzz and the reason people are talking about it is because Hannah Brown is somebody that is, quote-unquote, openly Christian, according to the article that I read. And she's somebody that refers to herself as a Christian, talks about Christianity, and that's what's created so much buzz here. And originally, she said that, oh, I've, I've slept with this guy two times, now I've actually slept with him. I'm telling you that actually it happened four times. And when she kicked this guy off, it caused kind of a stir because she had already slept with the guy, but apparently had no intention of, of pursuing him further or marrying him or whatever. And then earlier in the same season, again, going off the article, if anybody wants to give a better description or I'm characterizing it wrong, feel free to tell me, but I don't claim to know a whole lot about The Bachelor. Uh, earlier in that same season, she gave somebody else the boot who did not believe in premarital sex, and they had had a very open, very uh, public spat about that, and she specifically said that she believed that he was prideful in doing that. Apparently abstaining from sex before you're married means that you're proud and haughty and have your nose in the air. I, I don't really understand how you arrive at that, but again, I don't know anything about the players. I just know what, what was being told by the article because I'm not going to... I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I want to do my research and my due diligence on the show, but I'm not watching The Bachelor just for it. <laughs> but anyway, she said this, and this is what I really want to get at. She said, I have had sex, and honestly, Jesus still loves me. I am so over being slut-shamed and being, uh, being felt like that makes me not a woman of faith because, oh my gosh, I lived my life and made mistakes and sin every single day, and so do you, and so do you, and so do you. I'm also not going to say that me having sex in a windmill was just the scarlet letter on my chest to have. I'm not going to stand here and feel that way, and you're not going to make me feel that way. couple things here. First of all, there are some people, and I think that this is what she's trying to speak to, there are some people that think that there is sin and then there is sexual sin. And that's like a double super sin. And if you are in any way violating of that particular command in the gospel, then that's way, way worse than doing any of the little sins. Look, 
any sin, regardless of how small it may seem to a human being, is enough to separate you from God. Because unless you are perfect, unless you keep the law perfectly, and this is the this is an understanding going all the way back into the Old Testament, better explained by Paul in his book of Galatians and Ephesians, one sin is enough to keep you away from God, and it is only by His grace and the blood of His Son that we are able to come back into His presence after having committed that sin and being washed from that sin by His Son's blood. So, there's that. And I'm not trying to say that, or give any kind of cover to people that think about sexual sin as though it's some kind of super sin that sticks with you your whole life and you can't come back from it. The Scarlet Letter, which she's referencing there, and that's a reference I actually do know because it's literature. The reason the Scarlet Letter was a very unchristian thing to do is that it didn't matter if you repented. It didn't matter if you sought forgiveness or tried to change your ways. The Scarlet Letter stuck with you because you had done something once, and then that stuck with you for the rest of your life. That's not the way the Christian faith works. If you commit a sin, and then you repent of that sin, and by the way, the word repent means a changing of direction, that you're going in one direction and you alter course and go in the other direction, the direction that God wants you to go in, that you've actually had a change of heart and repented of your sin and strived to do better and to get sin out of your life. That's the opposite of what we're talking about in the Scarlet Letter. But the attitude that Brown is putting up here, it is just so incredibly Hollywood, and it's the perfect microcosm of what the world wants Christians to be. You see, the world would rather have Christians be not transformed, but conformed. They would rather somebody live the life of a Christian the way Hannah Brown does, which is she talks about being a Christian, but she lives like everybody else. Christians are apparently, according to her, supposed to just be indistinguishable from everybody else. That you just do whatever you want, sin as much as you want, and Jesus still loves you, so you're good. Apply that principle, since God is alluded to as our Father, apply that principle to your parents. Good parents will love you, no matter what you do. Well, my mom or dad will still love me no matter what I do. That is not an excuse to break into their house and steal money from them to fuel my drug addiction. Just to give an example, of course, I would never do that, and I also don't have a drug addiction, but you know what I'm saying. Love does not excuse any behavior. Does Jesus still love somebody that's caught in sin? Absolutely. Does he want them to continue in that sin? No. If you look at the way that he treats the woman in Samaria, the woman in the well, he doesn't come out at her and browbeat her with Scripture. Because she knew what she was doing was wrong. He didn't have to tell her that. She knew the law. She knew the lifestyle that she was living in was not right. But he did bring it to her attention. And he did want her to stop that. And you'll notice that the woman caught in adultery. What was the parting shot that he gave when she went on her way? He saved her life. He treated her like she was valuable. He showed her that he loved her. And he ended that exchange with, go and sin no more. You see, that's the part of this that is missing. We do not just continue in sin that Grace Mayer Brown, as Romans 6 will tell us. Would you think of somebody that committed some kind of action against you, whether it was lying to you or injuring you in some kind of way, and you forgave them. But if they kept doing it, if they kept doing it over and over and over again and showed no intention of stopping at all, would you really believe that they were sincere? Now imagine applying that same principle to God who actually sees into our heart and knows that it's not sincere. See, and that's really the difference. 
This is what the world wants a Christian to be. To come out to the world and say, I'm a Christian, I love God, by the way, I'm going to do whatever the heck I want to, not going to listen to any anything that the Bible says, I'm just going to live like everybody else and it's just cool. Not going to evangelize, not going to bother anybody. See, at that point, Christianity is meaningless. The power of the gospel is to transform a person from a life of sin to one that is spent constantly trying to subjugate yourself to God's will. That's the difference. The world would love for every Christian to be like Hannah Brown, which is being a Christian is basically a status on Facebook and nothing more. That you call yourself a Christian, you just kind of look at the pool of religions there and pick out the one that you like, the thing that kind of suits your fancy, the one that's fashionable at the moment, but you don't change anything about your life. And as far as shame, when something incorrect has happened, shame is an appropriate response to that. In fact, I remember that, and I've been going through the Minor Prophets recently, one thing that is consistent throughout the Minor Prophets, and some get worse than others, but the reason that Israel and the southern kingdom needed correction is because they had reached a point that they no longer felt shame. That they no longer even felt bad for doing things against God's will. I think that is really where this young lady is right now. That she has gone so far past feeling any kind of remorse, and you'll see in her statement that's exactly what she said, you're not going to make me feel that way. Well, no, nobody can make you feel anything. But if you can say that, and confess it on live TV, in front of God and everybody and your own family, and feel no remorse for having premarital sex, you're not a Christian. Now, if you came at it from the angle of, well, I've had sex in the past and I'm trying really hard to stop, and I've done everything in my power to keep that temptation away from me, okay. Doesn't matter how often you have made that mistake, the Christian thing to do would be forgive you. But this attitude of, ah, I have sex whenever I want to, and I am not changing anytime soon, and you're not going to make me feel bad about that. That is somebody that is securely in Satan's warm embrace. And the reason that that person is far more valuable to him than somebody who would be committing the big sins that we would think of is that somebody that everybody despises and everybody dislikes and everybody can clearly see that they're evil, that doesn't bring anybody over from the other side. Somebody that claims Christianity, somebody that claims to be living the way that God wants them to but lives exactly like everybody else, that's somebody that the devil can use to tempt others. And as attractive a young lady as she is, I can see how that would be the case. So that brings me to the verse of the day, and we'll look at 1 Peter Chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy." Now, that is an awful lot to digest, so I'm going to break it down as succinctly as I possibly can. And it goes along with what we've been talking about. The Christian is supposed to be a peculiar people, a holy nation. What does it mean to be holy, to be sanctified? It means set apart. The word ekklesia, the Greek word for the church, 
means the called out. The church is to be a group of people that is distinct from the world. Doesn't mean we never interact with them. In fact, we're commanded to interact with them as often as possible. It doesn't mean that we keep our nose up in the air and look down on other people because that's not what Christianity is about either. But what it does mean is if people can look at you and look at a non-Christian and can't tell the difference, you're doing something wrong. And that's something that we need to remember that even though, you know, there's nothing wrong with interacting with people that are not Christians, in fact, it's encouraged in the Bible, there's nothing at all wrong with having fellowship with those who are not members of the faith. There's nothing wrong with, you know, having some uh, engaging in the culture in the sense that it's not engaging in something that's sinful. That's okay. But when you start moving to a place to where, other than showing up to church an hour or two a week, you could look at the entire rest of a person's week and you wouldn't be able to tell a difference between someone who is a follower of Christ and just your average Joe that doesn't claim any religion. Yeah, well, if that's the case, then you're not a Christian. To be a disciple of Christ means somebody who is disciplined. That's what the word comes from. It means someone that follows in Christ's footsteps. So if it's something that Christ wouldn't do, then you do your best not to do it either. Now, one thing about her statement that is correct is that we do sin. And of course, if there were no sinners that were Christians, then there would be no Christians, because the whole point of Christianity is that it takes sinners and transforms them. But the problem here is she and so many other people in the world want to claim the label without claiming all the stuff that comes with it. You want to be able to say that you're a person of faith. You want to say that you're spiritual. You want to say that you follow Christ, but none of your actions reflect that. The way that the gospel presents it is somebody that denies what they want, picks up their cross, and follows Jesus. Does this sound like denial to you? Does this sound like somebody that is saying, well, I want this, but God says it's bad for me, so... I'm going to forego that in order to try to be a better follower of him, and I'm just going to trust that God knows better than me and to do the best that I can to do what he has prescribed for my life. Now, this is somebody that is saying, I'm going to do what I want. That's the difference in a holy nation that is talked about here. And the thing is, yes, it's going to offend people. And Peter says this right here in his epistle. He says that we are going to be a rock of offense. That because we are different, because we're set apart, because we're a holy nation, that there are going to be people that are not holy, that are not a part of that nation, that look at us and say, ooh, we don't like those people. That are going to say all kind of manner of evil things against us. Believe me, Peter understood that better than most. This is a man that, according to secular history we have, was killed for his beliefs. Do you really think somebody that lives exactly like everybody else and just claims Christianity as sort of a fashionable accessory, do you really think those people would be killed for their beliefs? No. Peter actually believed it, actually changed his life to try to follow God. And his reward was that he offended a lot of people. He also helped a lot of people. And I just gave a lesson yesterday. Go back and look at yesterday's chaplain's report. It is important that we make our message palatable to people, if at all possible. That we do the best that we can to persuade people, we have good relationships with people. I'm not saying that we don't do that. But you also don't sacrifice the truth. And sometimes the truth offends people. Sometimes telling them the truth, that the way that they're living is not correct, that it's hurting them, and that God is not pleased with their lifestyle, that ticks people off. Pete Buttigieg, perfect example of that. Somebody that claims to be a Christian says, oh yeah, I'm a Christian and I love God and by the way, I'm gay and I live how I want. We're all familiar with the hymn, just as I am. And I believe it. Because it's what the Bible teaches. That anybody from any walk of life, no matter how sinful, no matter how backward their life is, 
can come to God for healing and can say, Lord, just as I am, this is how I'm coming before you. What you don't get to say is, just as I am, and I'm staying that way. That you don't get to do. You come before God, aware of your sin, aware of your own moral failings, and ask Him to correct them. He accepts no less. Doesn't expect you to always be perfect, doesn't expect you to get it right 100% of the time, but He does expect you to do the best that you can to eradicate the sin in your life and to do the things that He's commanded for us to do. The world would rather take the Hannah Brown or the Pete Buttigieg example. Well, I'm going to say that I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to change any part of my life to actually try to live the way that Jesus lived. You can't do it. You can't serve two masters. You can't mix the, the new wineskin with the old wine, and vice versa. Anybody that puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of Christ. And neither I nor any other Christian gets it right 100% of the time. I don't even know if I'm batting over 500. But the difference is I'm actually trying really hard to make sacrifices, to deny the things that I know God does not want me to do. And this prosperity gospel style of Christianity to where ah, you just live the way you want to and God will sort it out at the end because he loves you. That's not the message that the gospel gave. That is not the message that Christ gave his own life to bring to other people. Jesus didn't die so you can do whatever you want. Jesus died to sanctify you as a holy priesthood that takes painstaking measures to present themselves a holy and righteous bride before him so that they can enter into the fellowship of his Father. That's what Jesus died for. And anybody that isn't on board with that can't call themselves a Christian. Stay the course, friends. Now, y'all know that I am a big believer in personal liberty, and that means I think that you should be free to decide for yourself whether or not you like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. However, I will say this. You know who else never subscribed to my channel? Hitler. So the way I see it, you have two options. You can either like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel, or you can be like Hitler. Totally up to you.